Hello everybody, I'm Karara and I'm back with another walkthrough. Today we're going to be looking at the 2018 EFMA and continuing where we left off with problem 9. Number 9. A uniform stick of mass M is originally on a horizontal surface. One end is attached to a vertical rope which pulls up with a constant tension force so that the center of mass of the stick moves upward with the acceleration A is less than G. The normal force on the ground on the other end of the stick shortly after the right end of the stick leaves the surface satisfies which is the following. Alrighty, so we have a mass M, we have a force F, and we want to find the force N over here. So basically, when I see these two forces, the first thing I'm thinking is torque, because we have a stick and we want the torque on it to be zero. No, but we don't want the torque to be zero because it is lifting off the ground, so that's not true. We also have mg, don't forget that, mg. And when I see all these forces and a center of mass acceleration, I immediately think we have to look at net force. So our net force should be F plus N minus mg, and this should equal to ma. And now we want to find our N. So solving for N, we just get N is equal to ma plus mg minus f. Alrighty, so we have this, and we want to see, look at our options. So we have this, now let's look at our options. A, n is equal to mg. Would that be correct? Let's look at our options. A, n is equal to mg. Could we say anything about that? Well, we have an ma and an f, which we both don't know. So we don't have enough information yet, so let's see what else we can find out. Maybe we could use torque, so we know that F is here. So that means that our torque with this as a pivot point would be torque is equal to F times L. And then the torque at this point should be, torque prime should be F over times L over 2. But does this help us? Let's see. Well, we know that torque is equal to I alpha. And then we know that alpha is equal to A over R. And we know that R is L over 2. So that means that this should be I A times 2 over L. Bro scheme, I'm actually brain farting. I have no idea how to do this. Let's see. Hey, but we're still going to keep trying. Well, the bottom part here is a straight up wrong, so let's take that out. Huh. I think we could still use this. Well, we know that a uniform stick has a moment of inertia of I is equal to, and we know that we want our pivot point on the end, so then our uh, I would be one third ML squared. Alrighty, and now if we now we have to solve something for our torque. So we have that our torque has F times the lever arm, which is L, minus MG times the lever arm, which is L over 2. So then we get that our I, we plug in our I2, and then we get 1 third ML squared times A times 2 over L is equal to FL minus MGL over 2. If we cancel everything out and simplify, we get 2 thirds MA is equal to F, MG, F minus MG over 2. And now we just plug this back into our previous equation, I think, and that should give us an answer. Let's see. So we get that N is equal to, we want to substitute that f because we ha are given that a is less than g and we know what g is, so, and all our answers are in terms of g, so there's no point in having an f, so let's just get rid of that. And we get ma plus mg minus two thirds ma minus mg over two. And this gives us, where else can we write it? Let's erase this. We get that n is equal to one third ma plus one mg over two, 
And since we know that a is less than g, this can't be greater than mg. This can't be equal to mg either. So it has can't be a, but it can't be c because we know that our a is positive. So it must be b. So let us check our answer. Nice, we did it. That was a kind of annoying problem. I did not see the solution immediately, but we got it eventually. That's what matters. Moving on to number 10. Number 10. Which of the following graphs best shows the acceleration versus time of an object originally moving upward in the presence of air friction? Alrighty. Didn't we do a similar problem to this already? Oh, acceleration versus time, though, not velocity versus time. So we basically have our object moving up, air friction, our mg is also down. Alrighty, so basically when it goes up, its velocity keeps slowing down, right, because of our air friction. But then our air friction also decreases because air friction is proportional to velocity. So that means that our downward acceleration should decrease, but it shouldn't decrease in a discrete thing like that. So it can't be this one or this one or, or even this one. So it's probably D but or E. It could be also E. But it also reaches the terminal velocity, so it should not be d because it never goes to zero. But e makes more sense because it slowly, slowly decreases in magnitude until it reaches zero, which is terminal velocity. So I think the answer should be e. Let's look at the answer. And we are correct. Moving on to number 11. Number 11. A light uniform ideal spring is fixed at one end. If a mass is attached to the other end, the system oscillates with angular frequency w. Omega, sorry, gotta get the Greek letters correct. Now suppose the spring is fixed at the other end and cut in half. The mass is attached between the two half springs. The new angular frequency of oscillations is... Alright, this is annoying. I, I never memorized the what happens if you cut a string in half, but we could derive it real quick. So basically to derive the spring constant of half spring, we basically draw out our full spring and then divide it imaginarily in half with a dotted line, and then let's say that our full spring is compressed by delta x, then our total force we know is just k delta x. But then, each of these springs, if the whole thing is compressed delta x, each one must be compressed delta x over 2. But now, we know that this spring pushes on this spring, and this spring pushes on the mass. But we know that this spring by itself must push on the mass by k delta x. So that means that k1, k prime times delta x over 2 is equal to kx. That shows us that k prime is just equal to 2k. Since both of the springs are also identical, then we also have the k prime for this one too, which is also 2k. So basically, if you split a spring in half, you're getting twice as much spring constant. So now that we've derived that, let's go on to the actual problem. Alrighty, so we have our springs on both sides of this ball over here. And each of these has a spring constant of k, 2k. So now whenever you look at a spring system, I always think about what happens if you displace it by delta x. So if you displace it by delta x, this spring gets compressed by delta x, and this spring gets stretched by delta x. So this spring would want to pull back. So it would pull back by 2k delta x, but this spring wants to push back because it's getting compressed. So it will push back by 2k delta x as well. So that basically means that our total force on the mass would be 4k delta x. And this is the case, this is basically just a big spring with spring constant 4k. We know that our angular frequency is just root k over m. So that basically means when we multiply our k by 4, we get 2 omega is equal to 2 root k over m. This means that our answer should be d. Is this right? Let's check. Yes, it is. All right, on to number 12. Number 12, a group of students wish to measure the acceleration of gravity with a simple pendulum. They take one length measurement of the pendulum to be L is equal to 1 plus or minus 0 0.05 meters. Then they measure the period of a single swing to be T is equal to 2 plus or minus 0 0.1 seconds. Assume that all uncertainties are Gaussian. The computed acceleration of gravity from this experiment illustrating the range of possible values should be recorded as... Ah, oh, I hate Gaussian equations, but whenever we have them, let's just write our equations that we need to know. So... Uncertainty of xy over xy is equal to the root of the uncertainty of x over the average value of x squared plus the uncertainty of y over 
average of y squared. So this is one of the most important ones. There's also the squared one, which basically says that uh, some uh, the uncertainty of x squared over x squared is equal to the uncertainty of x times 2 over x. All right. So these are the two equations that we're going to be using, but we also now have to find out what our equation for the actual variables are. So we know that the period of a pendulum t is equal to 2 pi root g over l. Sorry, l over g. And that means that we want to find the uncertainty of gravity. So that means we have to solve for gravity first, so let us do that. g is equal to 2 pi over t squared. Noise. So now what we got to do is find the uncertainty of 2 pi over t, and we can use this equation. This also applies to divide, so instead of x, y, it'll just be x divided by y, x divided by y, and then same on this side. To compute the uncertainty of 2 pi over t, we basically know that 2 pi is a constant, so its uncertainty is 0, so this term cancels out. And then our y, which is just t, has uncertainty 0 0.1, and then its average value is 2. And then we know that x, y, or x over y in this case, is just 2 pi over 2, which is pi. So that means our uncertainty must be pi times the root of this, which should be 0 0.1 over 2. All right, so that's our first uncertainty. Now we need to find the uncertainty of this squared. And that is just simply uh, 2 times this times x, the average value of x, which is just pi again. So basically, it would be our new uncertainty is pi squared times 0 0.1. And now we finally had to add in our L. So we basically use this equation again. And this one's the most complicated, but it should work out. So let's look at everything individually. So we're trying to solve for this. We know that x, y is just this whole thing, which is 2 pi over 2 squared times 1, which is basically pi squared. And then our x is also pi squared. Our y average is 1, as given in the problem. And then our uncertainty of y, which is l, is 0 0.05. And our uncertainty of x, which is this squared thing, is just right here. So plugging all that in, let's just erase some unnecessary equations like this one and let us write it in. Our uncertainty over pi squared is equal to the root of 0 0.1 squared plus our uncertainty over pi squared is equal to the square root of pi squared oh, times 0 0.1 over pi squared squared plus 0 0.05 over 1 squared. And this should give us that our uncertainty is, let us plug this into the calculator, pi squared times the square root of 0 0.1 squared plus the square root, I mean plus 0 0.05 squared and we get 1.1. And now we look at our answer choices. There's only one 1.1, so it must be D. Let's check the answer, and it is correct. Nice. Okay, moving on to number 13. Number 13, a massive cable of diameter 2.54 centimeters, one inch, is tied horizontally between two trees 18 meters apart. A tightrope walker stands at the center of the cable, giving it a tension of 7,300 newtons. The cable stretches and makes an angle of 1.5 degrees with the horizontal. The Young's model is, yeah, the Young's model is, defined as the ratio as of stress to strain, where stress is the force applied per unit area, and strain is the fractional change of the length delta L over L. The cable's Young modulus is, all right, let's see. So we basically have to find the force applied per unit area. So we have a cable, it looks like that, a nice little cylinder. And we know that the rate diameter is 2.54 centimeters. Two, oh, I can't write that small. 2.54 centimeters. All right, and that means that our area of this circle would be pi times 2.54 over 2 squared centimeters squared. And we want to find the force per unit area, and we know that the force is just 7,300 for every area. So that means that our stress is equal to 7,300 newtons over 
pi times, let's convert this to meters because that's easier, 0 0.0254 over 2 squared. And that should be our stress, and we'll calculate that later. But now let's find a strain. Let us erase this. So we basically have a triangle, and we have that this is one point, wait, wait for it, wait for it, 1.5 degrees here, and we have that this right here is 18 meters. And we could draw uh, altitude, and then this is 9. Okay, cool. So we have our 9 here, we have our angle here, which is also 1.5. So that means we could just find our length of this as 9 over cosine of 1.5. So our new length is L prime is equal to 9 over cosine of 1.5. And that gives us this length over here. So that means our delta L is just 2 times L, call it 2 times L prime, which is this, minus 2 times uh, this length. So we have 18 times, or rather divided by cosine 1.5 minus 18, and this is equal to our delta L, and then we had to divide by our L, which is 18, and then we get our strain. All right, so now we just add a divide stress by strain and we get our answer. Let us calculate each one individually and then we'll put it all together. 7300 over pi over 0 0.0254 over two, squared is equal to, that's a big number, but it should be approximately 1.44 times 10 to the 7, I think, yeah, 7, and then our strain should be 1, 1 over cosine 1.5, make sure it's degrees, and then minus 1. Wait, not in the parentheses, you don't want in the parentheses. Minus 1. Okay, so now we have to find our ratio of stress to strain. So we basically do stress over strain, which is 1.44 times 10 to the 7 divided by our answer, which is equal to 4.2 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. <laughs> Yeah, 10, wait, I don't know how to count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. All right, is that an answer choice? Uh, we're off by one factor of 10. Where did I mess up? Let us see. Give the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, well, I have no idea how to count. It seems 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10, okay, so it is the right answer. All right, E, E is our answer. Please be our answer, please. A, hey, good. Okay, we did. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys enjoy this kind of content, just let me down down in the comments if there's any other content you'd like me to do this for. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button and hit that subscribe button for more content. Thanks again for watching and see you guys next time.